Hey everyone, it's John again, and today we're going to continue back on the CCMP-based Switched video series. Okay, so if you recall from the previous video, we just discussed local VLANs. Now in this video, we're also going to discuss local VLANs, but in the context of a rooted access design. So if you're not familiar, what is a rooted access design? Well, let's just, let's just kind of cover it quickly. So if you remember, the previous video we discussed about making this link here layer 3, and all of these links here were layer 3, okay? But from this point downward, i.e. all these links, we still had layer 2 running through the network, okay? And the previous video discussed some of the, the issues with that and whatnot. In this one though, with a rooted access design, we basically migrate L3 right down to the access edge, which means that all of these routers here, you'll notice, they're layer 3 routers, layer 3 switches rather, performing routing. Now that means that the links between the, dis the distribution layer and the access layer, i.e. this link, and this link, and this link, so on and so forth, all these, they will all be given the no switch port command and given an actual IP address on the physical interface. So it's not going to be done on interface VLAN 10, interface VLAN 20, so on and so forth. You'll actually go into, say for example, switch 8, gigabit 0, 1, do no switch port and then give it an actual IP address with a slash 30 mask or perhaps a slash 31 mask. So that would convert it to a rooted access design, but why would you do that? Well, like I say, the actual parallels with the local VLAN design are quite striking. However, it takes it a step further, okay? Now, I don't know how well you follow my channel, but if you do, you might recall that I think it was about a... Um, now, a month or two ago, I put up a video pretty much demonstrating how to configure a rooted access design in a packet tracer file, and we did it with OSPF. And in the first part of that video, I go through the kind of advantages and disadvantages quite extensively. And I'm not going to go through it quite as much in this video, because I'm trying to keep it shorter, but I'll just put up the same notes which I use and just skim over them so you can get an idea. Okay, so advantages, no spanning tree feature placement. Because there's no STP, you don't need to worry about your root bridge, root guard, loop guard, all these things. There is no requirement for HSRP, VRRP, GLBP, i.e. There's no first hop redundancy protocol. In the previous um, design, whereby we still had layer 2 here, this device, do not clean this a bit ugly, that will clean this up a bit. This device would use these two as a pair as the first hop redundancy protocol, okay? And with that, you would have to configure um, your timers, perhaps authentication, your preemption priority, so on and so forth. In the case of a rooted access design, that is just simplified. We don't need to worry about that. We move the first hop redundancy, just basically your default gateway, not the redundancy, your, your first hop, your gateway, right down to here in this case. So it's going to be this switch here is going to act as a routing, and it's going to have these two paths going out, okay? That's simplified straight away by going full rooted access. Um, simplifies multicasting, your PIMDR, IGMP querer are aligned within one device. That's a bit out the scope of the CCMP, but just as a quick thing, um, when you've got your traditional layer 2 here, L3 here, you'll make maybe this switch here will be your HSRP active, and it's also going to be the root bridge for spanning tree, but what is often not talked about is that this will also be your PIM DR, okay, designated router. And conversely, this one would be your standby, it would be your secondary route bridge, and this one would also be your IGMP querier, okay? However, when you um, migrate that southbound right to the very access edge, that consolidates and synchronizes within one device, and it greatly simplifies things and keeps your L2, L3 multicast topology, uh, simple and consistent and really efficient. So that is an additional benefit, again, often overlooked. Uh, no trunking required, don't need to trunk them, no management VLANs, intelligent load balancing, like I said, we talked about no STP, all links are forwarding. Another important thing is when L2 fails, it fails open, and when L3 fails, it fails closed. Now, what does that actually mean? 
Well, that would mean that, let's say we've got L2 here, okay? We've got a layer 2 domain here. If we have a failure, what might happen is we get broadcast coming out. And we just get broadcast and broadcast and perhaps a broadcast storm. And the problem is with broadcasts, broadcasts are swirling about the network and they can be hard to identify where is the problem and how to diagnose it, how to fix it. When it comes to a rooted access design, we've got layer 3. Layer 3 fails closed. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's just say this switch here we'll take, for example, and let's say it's got a VLAN 10, and that's the address it's using, okay? So all the networks down here connected to it are in the 192.168.10.0. If we get a failure here, and we've got our all rooted access, this switch here will notice a neighbor loss straight away, this switch here will notice a neighbor loss straight away, and this subnet here will suddenly become unreachable. By that alone, you can infer pretty quickly where the problem is and how to diagnose it. So, like I say, it fails closed, it keeps the problems isolated, and it's a lot easier to spot. Like I say, in a real production environment, time is critical. The faster you can diagnose a problem, the better it is. Rooted access gives you that advantage straight away. Increased link utilization, all links forward. And we talked about this with local VLANs, how important that is. No span entry, all links are forward, and we can use equal cost multipath. This one's more of a tip build triangles, not squares, so that everyone is equal in cost. So you can use ECMP. Um, upstream recovery is ECMP. Downstream recovery is the routing protocol. That pretty much means that. Um, let me show you actually. Do you know what? I, I'm going to take the graphic from my project when I was doing this. Pretty much that means this, okay? So. This is the access layer, and these are your two distro switches. If this distro switch happens to blow out, traffic is calculated via ECMP and just straight reroutes from going from equal cost through here and here. If this fails, we just reroute straight away. Don't need to worry about a reconvergence. However, like I say, if there's a momentary disequilibrium from the access layer, i.e. down here, and we lose this switch, then will actually have a, a routing protocol reconvergence event. But like I say, in upstream failures, ECMP calculates uh, locally and the packets just keep shooting out. So you get really good performance because of that. Um, what else? You don't need to peer over VLAN SVI. There's no SVI downstate or auto phase state, uh, phases. That increases your uh, failure detection. And these are just some tips I wrote as well. Summarise the core to limit event propagation, reduce SPF calculations, change the hash values in the distro layer and mitigate Ceph polarization. These are just um, tips. You don't need to worry too much about this. Uh, convergence can be within or rather under 200 milliseconds, super fast. But like I say, with the rooted access design, you still want to implement STP at the very, very, very edge, i.e. from this point here. So it's not actually within the network. It's going to be really as a fail-safe at the edge for anyone plugging in switches and whatnot. And you're still going to have your basic security type stuff. Around. So you're still going to have um, storm control, 802.1x, quality of service, DHCP snooping, dynam dynamic ARP inspection, IP source guard, so on and so forth. Here's some of the dis disadvantages. It can be harder to initially plan and implement, although it's much more stable when it's up. And here's a thing, I talked about this in my VXLAN, uh, my VXLAN video. Some applications require L2 adjacencies. This is just a thing, unfortunately. Especially legacy stuff. Things like um, VMware migrating VMs. Things like Apple's Bonjour protocol. Really want to talk L2. You might be limited in your implementation unless you start using more complex strategies like VXLAN and stuff like that. Uh, Layer 3 switches are also more expensive. Not that much. The cost is coming down, but they still do cost more than your basic Layer 2 switch. Here's a thing that's I think is quite important. Not important, but you need to be aware of it. Segmentation strategies like VRF, when you're moving it southbound to the access layer, more devices are going to be configured. Now, that just could be a time thing. If you're happy doing that, that's completely cool. But just be aware of that. So that means that, let's say, if you had your VRF configurations in here, okay, and up here, okay, all your virtual routing tables. 
if all of these are written in order to keep the segmentation, all these need to have the same segmentation configured. So if you've got lots and lots of access switches, if you've got maybe like distro, distro and lots of access switches coming in, all of these are going to have to have your VRF configuration, for example, if you use your segmentation strategy. So just be aware of that. So like I say, that's just the basic overview of um, a rooted access design. So, so what I want to talk about as well is the actual IP addressing scheme in VLAN design when it comes to rooted access, because some people do get this a little bit confused and understandably so, because what very often you might do is, let's say we've got these four switches as you see here. Now on every switch we're going to have this um, really streamlined and deterministic VLAN plan and we're going to have every switch is going to have VLAN 10 will be a data VLAN, VLAN 20 will be a voice VLAN and let's say VLAN 30 can be just for things like printers and stuff like that, okay? So every switch is going to have VLAN 10, 20 and 30. This will also have 10, 20, 30. This will also have 10, 20, 30. And this will also have 10, 20, 30. Some people get this confused and think, wait the now, John, we're spanning VLANs. This VLAN appears on this switch and this switch and this switch. I thought you said you can't do that. Well, remember, this might have VLAN 10 and this might have VLAN 10, but they're not the same VLAN 10. Okay? They are going over rooted links. They're not the same VLAN at all. So you're actually not spanning the VLANs and each VLAN will have a different um, IP address. And so let's say in switch five, VLAN 10 might be, we'll use 10, um, zero, five to denote switch five in the VLAN number 10 slash 24, okay? So that would be VLAN 10 on this one. VLAN 10 on this one here would be maybe 10, zero, six, 10, slash 24, this one here, 7, 10, 0, 7, 10, so they're all separate VLANs, okay, just be aware of that because, like I say, some people seem to think that you can't do this, like if you hear somebody doing VLAN 10 all over the place, it's automatically spanned, well it's not, you've got to remember, if we've got that L3 boundary, they are not the same VLAN, if this broadcast VLAN 10, it's not going to hit this here, okay, it's not going to hit here, it's going to be terminating here, and that's it, so just be aware of that. And lastly, what I, what I just do is do a little demonstration of um, some of the failovers with um, uh, your rooted access design. So let's go in here and let's pull up PC. Um, where are we? System tools. IF config. Okay, now basically I've configured a loopback 8888 on the router up here. I'm just going to ping that. So, actually, you know what I'll ping? The, uh, the default gateway first, 192.168.10.1. And that's fine. And ping all the 8s. And that's fine as well. And I'll also use another one here. IF config, ping all the eights, and we have reachability. So what I'm gonna do is, I'll just do a bit of pinging here, I'll do ping, and I'll cre increase the interval actually, all the eights, so I'll just ping that a bit more frequently. Do the same here, ping interval, 0 0.2, and do all the eights. Okay, so we're pinging from both these PCs. Now what I'll do is, I'll just Go and do a packet capture on these two interfaces. So on this one and this one, so you can just see the traffic um, going through both of them. I don't know if you can hear this, there's actually a big massive dog fight going out outside my house. <laughs> In case you can hear all this barking and yapping. I think the small dogs win, it seems to be the, the more vocal of, the, of them all. <laughs> Um, okay, so anyway, back to the video. Gigabit 01, you can see the ICMPs. I'll just filter that for ICMPs. You can see that's going through here. Gigabit 10. 
And this one here. And we'll take the ethernet as well. Okay, so we've got ICMP going across here. Okay, so we've got ICMP going across both of these links. Okay. So, what I'll do is I'll just shut that down. Seen that. And I'll stop this just now. And I'll stop this. Actually, do you know what? It might be better visually. It might be easier to see this. If I just ping from the switch. Okay, so let's ping from a switch then. We'll ping from this one here, okay, and let's just do a ping all the eights and we'll repeat a bunch of times. Okay, so just keep your eye on that. And to simulate a link failure, we're going to shut this link down, gig one zero on switch three. We're going to pretend that switch three goes down. Uh, and gig one zero and we'll shut that link down. Keep your eye on the dots at the side. There we go. We'll just reroute, just saying EIGRP yeah, neighbours down, but we're not losing the packets, we're still pinging. And if we bring it back up... And the adjacent sequence comes back up. Okay, so I compare that to, say, a whole spanning tree issue. We need to start sending out BPDUs and recalculating. In the case of ECMP, just fast reroute, just switch over to the other path. It can be done locally within the router, okay? So that's pretty much the end of this video on um, the routed access design. Like I say, in that other video I did with Packet Tracer, I go into a little bit more detail if you want to see um, more about the actual configuration. This is more just kind of a conceptual um, video comparing it to the local VLAN design and the spanned VLAN design. So this is local VLANs in a routed access context. Like I say, you can keep reusing the same VLAN number because they're not the same VLAN because they're separated via layer 3. Um, and that's pretty much one thing you really remember. So that's the end of the video. And thanks very much. And I'll see you guys soon. Okay, doke. Bye-bye.